Pope Francis and fundamentalism. There's uh, several people who have claimed that uh, Pope Francis condemned fundamentalism. We're going to ask uh, several questions. One, are the claims true? Two, what is fundamentalism? Three, what did the Pope mean when he said what he said? And four, what is the societal context? And five, should fundamentalists be alarmed about this? Uh, well, first uh, let's ask the, are the claims true? This is a quote from the address of His Holiness Pope Francis to participants in the meeting promoted by the Instituto para el Dialogo Interreligioso, Religioso, pardon me, uh, de la Argentina, uh, or IDI as it's known otherwise, and uh, you can get this on the internet, uh, apparently from the papacy itself, and um, the quote reads, beware of the fundamentalist groups. Everyone has his own. In Argentina, too, there is a little fundamentalist corner. And let us try with fraternity to go forward. Fundamentalism is a scourge. Now, we're going to read the whole thing in its context in just a little bit, but obviously, Pope doesn't think much of fundamentalism. Well, that raises a question, what is fundamentalism? Well, the term originated with Christians who claimed to believe in the fundamentals of Christianity. The Encyclopedia Britannica, which is of course not friendly to uh, 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 creation intelligent design or a fundamentalist Christianity, so I think is certainly uh, not biased towards them, um, has this article which we'll go through. We won't read the whole thing, but we'll read parts of it. Um, and again, this is on, available online under Christian Fundamentalism. Christian Fundamentalism, movement in American Protestantism that arose in the late 19th century in reaction to theological modernism, which aimed to revise tr traditional Christian beliefs to accommodate new developments in the natural and social sciences, especially the theory of biological evolution. So fundamentalism is a reaction against the standard interpretation of a scientific theory. In keeping with traditional Christian doctrines concerning biblical interpretation, notice that they are traditionalists, they're not trying to break new ground, they're just trying to hold what used to be the standard way of looking at things. The mission of Jesus Christ and the role of church in society, fundamentalists affirmed a core of Christian beliefs that included the historical accuracy of the Bible, number one. Number two, the imminent and physical second coming of Jesus Christ. And th two, and three, Christ's virgin birth, four, resurrection, see resurrection, and atonement. For uh, fundamentalism became a significant phenomenon in the early 20th century and remained an influential movement in American society into the 21st century. See also Evangelical Church. So that's the list that he has, or that the encyclopedia has. Historical accuracy of the Bible, physical coming of Jesus Christ, second coming of Jesus Christ, Christ's virgin birth, Christ's resurrection, and Christ's substitutionary atonement. Well, if you go to kind of the more standard uh, versions, and, and you can find this in a number of different places, but Christianity Today is probably as good as any place, uh, who were fundamentalists. Um, their list is the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture, the virgin birth of Christ, the substitutionary atonement of Christ, the bodily resurrection of Christ, the historicity of the biblical miracles. And by the way, you'll notice that uh, Many of us wouldn't have too much trouble with uh, either list, or maybe a little bit of trouble with some, but not much. Um, and you'll notice that the two lists are pretty similar. If we move the uh, physical second coming of Jesus Christ out of the way, move the virgin birth up, move the substitutionary atonement up, and move the physical coming 
of Jesus Christ, it matches pretty well except for the latter. And the historicity of the biblical miracles is a point that's probably there, but the interesting thing is that there are a lot of people that feel that if you have a bodily resurrection of Christ, then according to, for example, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, you pretty much are stuck with a bodily resurrection of, um, of the uh, believers at the second coming as well. Um, Continuing the paragraph, uh, the uh, article, revivalism, it talks about, and then it says, though fundamentalists are not not notably ascetic, they do observe certain prohibitions. Many fundamentalists do not smoke, drink alcoholic beverages, dance, or attend movies or plays. Hmm. Uh, those, that list may sound familiar to you. At most fundamentalist schools and institutes, these practices are strictly forbidden. Yeah? Origins. During the 19th century, major challenges to traditional Christian teaching arose on several fronts. Geologic discoveries revealed Earth to be far older than the few thousand years suggested by literal reading of the biblical book of Genesis and the various scriptural genealogies. The work of Charles Darwin and his colleagues established that human beings as a species had emerged over millions of years through a process of evolution rather than suddenly by di divine fiat. Now one of the things that's interesting in this article is that although usually it carefully tries not to take sides, on these two points it does. Um, so fundamentalists are fundamentally wrong if you want to put it that way. Um, then going on and you'll notice now it'll be softer. Social scientists and philosophers influenced by Herbert Spencer advocated a parallel theory of progressive social evolution that refuted the traditional uh, religious under understandings of human sin, which was predicated on the notion that after the fall from grace, the human condition was corrupt beyond repair. In other words, things are getting better and better instead of worse and worse. Um, Meanwhile, some ministers in various denominations ceased to emphasize the conversion of individuals to the religious life and instead proposed a social gospel that viewed progressive social change as a means of building the kingdom of God on earth. A more direct challenge to traditional Christianity came from the scholars who adopted a critical and historical approach to studying and interpreting the Bible. This perspective known as modernism treated the books of the Bible, especially the first five, Notice those are the ones that have to do with creation, among other things, and also the Exodus. Um, not as simple documents written by a single author, but as complex texts constructed by multiple authors from several older sources. Now, see, this is the way it, the perspective treated it, and you see how they're softer than they are on the evolution thing. Although modernism offered a solution to many problems posed by seemingly contradictory biblical passages, notice seemingly, see they're soft, it also raises severe, raised severe doubts about the historic, historical accuracy of the biblical text, leading scholars to revise the traditional history of the biblical era and to reconsider the nature of biblical authority. And then they discuss modernism and Roman Catholicism in a different place. The issue of biblical authority was crucial to American Protestantism, which had inherited the fundamental doctrine of sola scriptura, as enunciated by Martin Luther and other 16th century reformers. That's one thing that the reformers pretty much all agreed on. Thus, any challenge to scriptural integrity had the potential to undermine Christianity as they understood and practiced it. In response to this challenge, theologians at Princeton Theological Seminary argued for the verbal or word for word inspiration of scripture and affirmed that the Bible was not only infallible, correct on when it spoke on matters of faith and morals, that's an interesting definition of infallible, uh, but inerrant, correct when it spoke on any matters including history and science. My definition of infallible would include uh, correct when it spoke on any matters including history and science. Then it, the next paragraph discusses dispensationalism and the paragraph after says, although most Protestant churches rejected the broad teachings of the Plymouth Brethren, 
that's dispensationalism. Many accepted the premillennialism of Darby's followers. They believed that the next important event in human history would be the coming of Christ to justify and redeem his people and establish them in leadership over a millennial or thousand year kingdom. Well, that's uh, comfortable, I think. Singular interest in the second coming, an issue promoted by William Miller and the Adventist churches in the 1830s and 40s, and continuing on, I might add, inspired a popular movement through, uh, through the Niagara Bible Conference, and then it lists a number of ministers there, and you'll notice that they came from various denominations, Baptist, Presbyterian, Baptist, Presbyterian, um, Episcopal Church, although that one left the Episcopal Church and went to the Reformed Episcopal Church, and then another Baptist and a Church of England. So from various people from various places. Chicago evangelist Dwight L. Moody, you may have heard of him, provided an influential platform for millennial expression in his Northfield, Massachusetts conferences. The late 19th to the mid 20th century, during the last years of the 19th century, this is 1890s and so forth, the millennial movement was divided over issues of prophetic interpretation, but Brooks manages to hold the dissident factor, factions together. Within a few years of his death, however, the Niagara Conference was abandoned. And there's a section on church trials and with her, uh, heresy and apostasy being charged, charged against Charles Briggs, a minister of the Presbyterian Church who denounced the idea of verbal inspiration. I mean, there's a little more to it than that, I think, but whatever. Uh, there's a book called The Fundamentals, A Testimony to the Truth, which was published by the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, and if you'll notice, the initials of that are B-I-O-L-A. Of course, that's the precursor of Biola University. In 1990, 1919, conservative or fundamentalist leaders reiterated the creedal basis of the movement and called for the rejection of modernism and related trends, especially the teaching of the theory of evolution. And uh, there were a number of uh, uh, churches that were affected by this, Episcopal, Congregational, Methodist, Episcopal, ba American Baptist, and Presbyterian denominations in the North, Southern Baptist Convention and the Methodist Episcopal Church, the Northern Baptist, Presbyterians, and then it mentions the Scopes Trial. By the end of the 1920s, fundamentalists had lost control of the major denominations and had given up hope of recapturing them. Then they made independent Bible institutes and Bible colleges. There was a conflict between premillennialism and postmillennialism, uh, which the premillennialists pretty much won. Adventists, I might add, are premillennialists. The uh, fundamentalist denunciation of modernist theology and their censure of church-related institutions of higher learning often led them to reject contemporary education. This, in turn, contributed to the impression of many outsiders that fundamentalism was essentially anti-intellectual. At the same time, the fundamentalist, notice how soft that is? Not like the, the theory of evolution is just there. At the same time, the fundamentalist withdrawal from larger denominations and their decrying of certain trends in contemporary society conveyed the impression that they were opposed to science and culture. Well, that all depends on which culture you're talking about, of course. And it depends on which science you're talking about, too. But by the end of the 1930s, the largest segment of the fundamentalist movement, believing that a conservative restatement of faith representing the best of conservative scholarship was compatible with contemporary intellectual culture distanced itself from the separatists. They dropped the fundamentalist label which they left to the separatists and formed the so-called neo-evangelical movement. Christianity Today, which we quoted earlier, was founded as their major periodical. Their new intellectual center, Fuller Theological Seminary was opened in Pasadena, California. Many of the schools formerly identified with fundamentalism, such as the Moody Bible Institute, also moved into the evangelical camp. A new ecumenical or organization, the National Association of Evangelicals, was organized in 1942. 
the mid 20th century to the present. Although fundamentalism was pushed to the fringe of the Christian community by the new evangelical movement, it continued to grow as new champions arose. The Baptist Bible Fellowship formed uh, in 1950 became one of the largest fundamentalist denominations. Jerry Faldwell, Bob Jones University, Pat Robertson, Tim LaHaye. The person that I'm missing in all this is Carl F. H. Henry. The see, scientific creationism in the 1990s, some creationists advocate the teaching of a doctrine known as intelligent design, according to which the diversity and complexity of living things is impossible to explain except by positing the existence of an intelligent creator, which of course would strike directly at Darwinism. In 1979, Faldwell f founded the Moral Majority. Faldwell cooperated with non-fundamentalists and common secular causes but remained aloof from the major fundamentalist organizations. Um, I guess maybe didn't join them or something, but certainly was aligned with them in spirit. But in the um, late 20th century, some fundamentalists even began to engage in discussions with conservative members of the Roman Catholic Church. Traditionally regarded, by the way, are those fundamentalist Catholics? We'll, we'll uh, just raise that as a possibility. Traditionally uh, regarded by fundamentalists as a non-Christian cult, Protestant fundamentalists and conservative Catholics found common ground on a variety of issues, including abortion and school prayer. Fundamentalists were strong supporters of President George W. Bush. In 2016, many fundamentalists supported Donald Trump's candidacy for U.S. President in an attempt to secure a conservative Supreme Court appointment. Though several notable leaders were put off by his polarizing and unchristian remarks during his campaign. Although, if you think about it, consider the alternative in that candidate. Uh, at the start of the 21st century, fundamentalist teachings were not significantly different from what they were at the time of the Niagara Conference. So they haven't moved. They're still the same. Fundamentalists still believed in the inerrancy and infallibility of the Bible and rejected critical Bible, biblical scholarship and the many new translations of the Bible to which such scholarship gave rise. A significant percentage of the movement continued to use the King James Version of the Bible exclusively. Um, uh, maybe that's partly familiarity, but maybe it's partly because they like the underlying Greek text of the King James Bible, and of course there is now the New King James Version. And that's the end of that uh, article. You'll notice that there's, uh, that fundamentalism has been used in different ways. Fundamentalist Muslims, for example, is very commonly used. I suppose they believe the Quran rather than the Bible. Uh, they certainly don't believe in the substitutionary atonement. I'm um, not sure what are the other things that uh, make them fundamentalists. Um, it's almost like, well, they're going to kill you, and so that makes them fundamentalists, although I didn't read anything in there with the fundamentalist Christians forming an army to kill everybody who didn't believe uh, as they did. There are fundamentalist Hindus, and that raises, that, that really stretches it because what do they believe? Is it the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Gita, excuse me, the Vedanga? There's a bunch more texts that could possibly be believed. Um, the, now it seems to, to have completely degenerated to we'll fight for our religion, which, again, I'm not seeing as a major part of the fundamentalists. Uh, Christians. Um, in fact, there have <laughs> been people who call on fundamentalist atheists, um, atheists who believe and who f fight for it. So it sounds like there's two poles. One of them is we believe in what Christianity used to stand for and really still should, at least in our opinion. And the other side is, and we'll kill you if you don't uh, convert to our uh, way of thinking. Now, think about those distinctions and then 
we're going to get to Pope uh, uh, Francis. Uh, fundamentalist is simply an insult in this way of looking at, which apparently is used for people who are sure of their positions and extreme, and except for Christians, are willing to kill anybody who gets in their way. Well, so let's go back to that uh, uh, address and we'll read the whole thing, or at least most of it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to welcome all of you who are taking part in the meeting focused on, on the document Human Fraternity for World Peace and Living Together signed in Abu Dhabi last 4 February. Wait a minute. So there's a whole different context to this. In Abu Dhabi, that's not a Christian um, country, at last I knew. Um, the Apostolic Journey of His Holiness, so what is that? If you click on that link, this is what you get. To the United Arab Emirates, yeah, that's Abu Dhabi, all right. Uh, a document on human fraternity for world peace and living together. And again, this is available online. The introduction says, faith leads a believer to see the, in the other a brother or sister to be supported and loved. Through faith in God who has created the universe, something that Muslims and Christians agree on, creatures and all human beings equal on account of his mercy, believers are called to express this human fraternity by safeguarding creation in the entire universe and supporting all persons, especially the poorest and those most in need, which is an interest of both Christians and Muslims. And you'll notice that a good share of this is what I would call kind of boilerplate. Um, this transcendental value served as a starting point for several meetings characterized by a friendly and fraternal atmosphere where we shared the joys, sorrows, and problem, uh, problems of our contemporary world. We did this by considering scientific and technical progress, therapeutic achievements, the digital era, the mass media, and communications. We also reflected on, uh, on the level of poverty, conflict, and suffering of so many brothers and sisters in different parts of the world as a consequence of the arms race, social injustice, corruption, inequality, moral decline, terrorism, discrimination, extremism, and many other causes. Okay, from our fraternal and open discussion and from the meeting that ha expressed profound hope and a bright future for all human beings, the idea of this document on human fraternity was conceived. It is a text that has been given honest and serious thought so as to be a joint declaration of good and heartfelt aspirations. Profound. It is a document that invites all persons who have faith in God and faith in human fraternity, all persons, to unite and work together so that it may serve as a guide for future generations to advance a culture of mutual respect and the awareness of the great divine grace that makes all human beings brothers and sisters. Um, think about this from the perspective of Islam, it's interesting. From the perspective of the Catholic Church, it's interesting. And it sounds like trying to get everybody together to kind of a world I don't want to say government yet because they haven't talked about government, but they uh, certainly um, a world body, a, a, f a friendship document. In the name of God, who has um, created all human beings equal in rights. As I read that, I hear in the name of Allah, the magnificent, uh, the uh, merciful, um, equal in rights, duties, and dignity, and who has called them to live together as brothers and sisters, to help fill the earth and make known the values of goodness, love, and peace. In the name of innocent human life, the God has forbidden to kill, as you can imagine, this is in the name of about nine times. Um, affirming that whoever kills a person is like one who kills the whole of humanity, and that whoever saves a person is like one who saves the whole of humanity. If you stop right there and ask the question, that may not sound familiar to you. It may. If you've read the Quran, it should. Well, it's also Jewish. It's, um, in fact, it's virtually a quote of Surah 5, I think it is 32. It's either 31 or 32. I looked it up. And it uh, very, very much closely matches that. 
in the name of the poor, the destitute, the marginalized, and those most in need whom God has commanded us to help as a duty required of all persons, especially the wealthy and of means. In the name of orphans, widows, refugees, and those exiled from their homes and their countries. In the name of all victims of war, persecution, and injustice. In the name of the weak, those who live with fear, prisoners of war, those tortured in any part of the world without distinction. In the name of peoples who have lost their security, peace and po the possibility of living together become victims of destruction, calamity, and war. In the name of human fraternity that embraces all human beings united and renders them all equal, renders them equal. In the name of this fraternity torn apart by policies, I guess there's 10, of extremism and division by systems of unrestrained profit or by hateful ideological tendencies that manipulate the actions and the future of men and women. In the name of freedom that God has given to all human, be human beings, creating them free and distinguish them by this gift. In the name of justice and mercy, the foundations of prosperity and the cornerstone of faith. In the name of all persons of goodwill present in every part of the world. Which sounds interesting, um, peace on earth to those of goodwill. In the name of God and of everything stated thus far, Al-Azhar Al-Sharif and the Muslims of the East and West together with the Catholic Church and the Catholics of the East and West. So this is a Catholic and Muslim joint declaration. Declare the adoption of a culture of dialogue as the path, mutual cooperation as a code of conduct, reciprocal understanding as the method and standard. You'll run into this again, uh, not in this document but in the other. We who believe in God and in the final meeting with him and his judgment on the basis of our religious and moral responsibility and through this document call upon ourselves, upon the leaders of the world as well as the architects. Uh, so it is one world, uh, at least a kind of a world government uh, advisory at the best, at, at least. Um, <clears throat> leaders of the world as well as the architects of international policy and world economy to work strenuously to spread the culture of tolerance and living together in peace to intervene at the earliest opportunity to stop the shedding of innocent blood and to bring in an end to wars no, not to stop the shedding of blood just innocent blood um, conflicts environmental decay and the moral and cultural decline that the world is presently experiencing so we got to fix the world Skipping over a couple of paragraphs, which are mostly boilerplate again. You can look it up if you think I've got it wrong. There exists both a moral deterioration that influences international action and a weakening of spiritual values and responsibility. All this to, contributes to a general feeling of frustration, isolation, and desperation, leading many to fall either into a vortex of atheistic, agnostic, or religious extremism. You can be, I guess, extremism of atheist or agnostic or religious. And notice it doesn't say Muslim Christian. Uh, in fact, it, that gets interesting later. Or into blind and fanatic extremism. I'm not sure what the difference between those two is, but whatever. Which ultimately encourages forms of dependency and individual or co collective self-destruction. If you can figure out exactly what that means, I, you're better than I am. Um, it is clear in this context how the family as a fundamental nucleus of society and humanity is essential in bringing children into the world, raising them, educating them, and providing them with solid moral formation and domestic security. To attack the institution of the family, to regard it with contempt or to doubt its important role is one of the most threatening evils of our era. So what in our era is attacking the family? Well, there must be something attacking the family because it's one of the most threatening er evils of our era. Um, boy, um, are they uh, opposing gay marriage, maybe? Uh, it's not clear. But certainly they don't want to say whatever it is out loud, maybe because if you don't say it out loud, they people who are opposed to you won't realize that you're actually opposed to them. Anyway, the first and most important aims of, aim of religion is to believe in God, okay, to honor him and to invite all men and women to believe that this universe depends on a God who governs it. 
This is something that both the Christian and the Muslims can agree on. He is the creator who has formed us with his divine wisdom and has granted us the gift of life to protect it. We therefore condemn all those practices that are a threat to life, such as genocide, okay, act of terrorism, forced displacement, human organ trafficking, I think that's aimed at China, uh, abortion, and euthanasia, and that's aimed at the Netherlands, among other places. Um, we likewise condemn the policies that promote these practices. Moreover, we resolutely declare that religions must never incite war, hateful attitudes, hostility, and extremism. Remember that this is being said by uh, an Islamic imam, as well as the Pope. Nor must they incite violence or the shedding of blood. These tragic realities are the consequences of a deviation from religious teachings. So among other things, the imam is saying that when people, religious people, religions incite war, hateful attitudes, hostility, and extremism, they are a deviation from religious teachings. Now you'll find out that Pope Francis feels that's the case too, and of interest, he will apply it to the Crusades later on, not in this document. Uh, God the Almighty has no need to be defended by anyone and does not want his name to be used to terrorize people. That's a pretty interesting statement coming from an imam. Um, skipping over again a couple of paragraphs of boilerplate. Freedom is a right of every person. Each individual enjoys the freedom of belief, thought, and expression and action. The pluralism and diversity of religions, whoa, wait a minute. I thought you're not supposed to have pluralism of religion. Apparently, the Pope's happy with that, and the Imam is happy with that. Color, sex, race, and language are willed by God in his wisdom through which he created human beings. This divine wisdom this is the source from which the right to freedom of belief and the freedom to be different derives. Keep that in mind. Therefore, the fact that people are forced to adhere to a certain religion or culture must be rejected, as to the imposition of a cultural way of life that others do not accept. Skipping again, uh, dialogue among believers means coming together in the vast spaces of spiritual, human, and shared social values, and from here, transmitting the highest moral virtues that religion aims for. It also means avoiding unproductive discussions. And unfortunately, there isn't much context for that. I don't know what unproductive discussions are that one is supposed to be avoiding. Um, and remember, it, they have to be unproductive both to, or at least there have to be two different interpretations, maybe, or the same interpretation, um, both to Catholics and to Muslims. The protection of places of worship, synagogues, churches, and mosques. Whoa! Did you notice? Uh, churches and mosques, I expect, synagogues are interesting in this uh, context. So apparently, there, uh, somebody is sticking up for and managed to slip into the document without objection that synagogues are to be left alone. Is a duty guaranteed by religions, human values, laws, and international agreements. Every attempt to attack places of worship or threaten them by violent assaults, bombing, or destruction is a deviation from the teachings of religions, including, I suppose, Islam, as well as um, a clear violation of international law. The concept of citizenship is based on the equality of rights and duties under which all enjoy justice. It is therefore crucial to establish in our societies the concept of full citizenship and reject the discriminatory use of the term minorities which engenders feelings of isolation and inferiority. Uh, if this were adopted in Islamic countries that would be make things very interesting and uh, different from what's happening today. Its misuse paves the way for hostility and discord. It and undoes any successes and takes away the religious and civil rights of some citizens who are thus discriminated against. 
Skipping on, it is essential requirement to recognize the rights of women to education and employment. Think about uh, modern Islam and to recognize their freedom to exercise their own political rights. Moreover, efforts must be made to free women from historical and social conditioning that runs contrary to the principles of their faith and dignity. It is also necessary to protect women from sexual exploitation and from being treated as merchandise or objects of pleasure or financial gain. Uh, efforts must be made to modify those laws that prevent women from fully enjoying their rights. Interesting document, no? To this end, by mutual cooperation, the Catholic Church and Al-Hazar, al, -Hazar, al -Ha uh announce and pledge to uh, convey this document to authorities, influential leaders, persons of religion all over the world, appropriate regional and international organizations, organizations within civil society, religious institutions, and leading thinkers. They further pledge to make known the principles contained in this de declaration at all regional and international levels while requesting that these principles be translated into policies, decisions, legislative texts, course of study, and materials to be circulated. Full press. And then there's some concluding paragraphs. And this is in Abu Dhabi on the 4th of February of 2019. That's this year. His Holiness Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Al-Hazar Ahmad Al-Tayeb, who is, as I understand it, uh, currently in Egypt. And one of the, you know, you, Islam is not in the same, well, I guess actually maybe it is in the same position because obviously there are several branches of Islam just like there are several branches of Christianity. So coming back, that's that human fraternity and world peace and living together. So when he says that, remember that all of the further discussion has to do with this document. I thank all the organizers of this meeting. Uh, you can read all that stuff. It's that kind of general boilerplate again. I'm pleased to note that this document, which is universal in nature, is also being disseminated in the Americas, presumably including North America, uh, United States and Canada in specific, as I said during the World Conference of Fr Human Fraternity, there is no alternative. We will either build the future together or there will not be a future. So it's urgent for us to, <coughs> religions in particular cannot renounce the urgent task of building bridges between peoples and cultures. The time has come when religions should more actively exert themselves with courage and audacity and without pretense to help the human family deepen the capacity for reconciliation, the vision of hope, and the concrete paths of peace. And we all want peace. The world observes us believers to see what our attitude is toward the common home and to human rights. It also asks us to collaborate among ourselves and with men and women of goodwill who do not pr profess any religion so that we may give effective responses to the many scourges in our world, such as war, hunger, the poverty that afflicts millions of people, the environmental crisis, which I guess now includes climate change, um, violence, corruption, and moral degeneration, the crisis of the family and of the economy, and above all, the lack of hope. The intention of the document is to adopt the culture of the document as a way. This should sound familiar to you. Um, common collaboration is conduct. Mutual knowledge is a method and criterion. From now on, it can be affirmed that religions are not a closed system that cannot be changed, but with their own identity. Now, if it, they have their own identity, how can they be changed uh, without changing their identity? And this is the key, identity cannot be negotiated. Because if you negotiate identity, there is no dialogue. There is submission. So Catholics are gonna stay Catholics and Muslims are gonna stay Muslims, but they're gonna dialogue. With their own identity, they are in motion. Well, if they're in motion, then their identity changes, no? Um, this is a little confusing makes you wonder whether it was intended to be a little confusing, but we'll leave that alone. Fraternity is a complex human reality to which one must pay attention and treat with delicacy. 
When God asks us, where is your brother? The first question on fraternity that is in the Bible, where is your brother? No one may answer, I do not know. And of course, the rest of that is, am I my brother's keeper? Then different questions arise. How can we take care of each other in the one human family to, in which we are all brothers? How can we nurture a fraternity so that it is not theoretical and so that it, it translates into fraternity? That's an interesting sentence. I thought if you have a fraternity, it's already fraternity, but it doesn't need to be translated, but whatever. Um, how can we make the conclusion, continuing the paragraph, of, other, of the other prevail over exclusion in the name of belonging? What can we do so that religions are channels of fraternity instead of barriers of division? Now this, less, less, this next paragraph is fascinating a little history should alarm us. Religious wars, Christians, and remember, this is not with the Muslims. This is now Pope, Pope speaking to Christians. Let us think of the last 30 years. Now, that would be 1989. That would be the fall of the Soviet Union. I'm not sure that that, that marks a, an exact period. Um, Maybe it's 25 years since 2001. Um, uh, religious wars in Christianity in the last 30 years haven't been too prominent, I don't think. Maybe the Irish uh, Catholic versus Protestant, but that was resolved in the last 30 years. What struck me is maybe they're talking about the Thirty Years' War. If you just take out the last, it would work. Even if we just think of St. Bartholomew's Eve. Anybody know what happened on St. Bartholomew's Eve? That was when the Huguenots were slaughtered by the Catholics in France. Apparently, Pope Francis is indicating that's not a good idea. If one does not feel a little alarmed inside, one should wonder why. It is important to demonstrate that we believers are a factor of peace for human societies and that we will thus respond to those who unjustly accuse religions, maybe justly in some cases, uh, of fomenting hatred and being the cause of violence. Um, in today's precarious world, dialogue among religions is not a sign of weakness. It finds its own reason for being, sorry, I don't want to try the French, in God's dialogue with humanity. Uh, it is about changing historical attitudes. A scene from the Song of Roland comes to me as a symbol. When the Christians, by the way, these are the Catholic Christians, Defeat the Muslims and put them all in line in front of the baptismal font and one with a sword. And Muslims had to choose between baptism or the sword. Now, of course, the Muslims have a uh, uh, slogan, uh, the uh, Quran tribute or the sword, so that Muslims have the same problem. But here he's speaking about Christians. Muslims had to choose between baptism or the sword. This is what we Christians did. It was a mentality that today we cannot accept or understand, nor can it work anymore. And here comes that quote that we started with. Beware of the fundamentalist groups. Everyone has his own. In, is he talking about Catholic fundamentalists as well? Is he talking about fundamentalist Protestants? In Argentina, too, there's a little fundamentalist corner. There's, those are the only major groups that I know of. I don't think there are a lot of fundamentalist Muslims in Argentina. Um, and let us try with fraternity to go forward. Fundamentalism is a scourge. And all religions have some kind of fundamentalist first cousin there, which forms a group. So you can lump fundamentalist Protestants with fundamentalist Catholics, I guess, 
with fundamentalist Muslims, with fundamentalist Hindus, they form a group. I hope that this message of fraternity will be received by the international community for the good of the whole human family, which must move from simple tolerance to true coexistence and peaceful coexistence. Keep up the good work. And please do not forget to pray for me as I need it. Thank you. That is the message. It's copyrighted. I hope they don't get me for reproducing it. I'll plead that it was uh, uh, fair use. We'll see. The Pope seems to be including fundamentalist Christians in his remarks. He has to if he's talking about Argentina. His description seems to be lumping them in with other fundamentalists. And now, I would agree that the Westboro Baptist Church would mostly fit his description. The major thing is that I don't know that they go around shooting people, but they do make themselves rather obnoxious. But most fundamentalist Christians that I know should not be classified with fundamentalist Muslims, for example, certainly in their uh, willingness to enforce their opinion on everybody else. Some fundamentalists argued for religious freedom long before the papacy did. And I, Adventists have had a uh, uh, Department of Religious Liberty for over a hundred years. And it is not clear why they should not get the same tolerance that the Pope is willing to give Muslims. As long as they're not shooting people or I hope the present Pope is simply succumbing to present stereotypes. Otherwise, it would not bode well if he is seeking to unite the world against fundamentalist Christians. Uh, but that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. Of course, we know that that doctrine is not document it's not going to work in this world just to have peace and fraternity um, when even when Jesus came he did not denounce the Roman imp government which was horrendous yeah maybe had some good laws about it but his object, um, besides his own role, was the conversion of souls to get one individual by individual to accept him as their savior mm -hmm. and to accept the body. I th anyway, uh, you get my point. Yeah. And otherwise, they're going to, if they're going to try to, are they going to enforce this? And if they do, that freedom goes out the door. So there's, maybe it's just, of course, we know what is behind the papal intent, eventually what's, what's going to happen. Um, anyway, on fundamentalism, I thought he was saying it in a meaning fanatic, fanatical. Yeah, way. and it raises an interesting question. If you were a nice fundamentalism that, let's say we're pacifist, would that be good enough? Yeah. Uh, uh, He's using it very gently. Uh, you know, it's of interest that the people who are trying to promote world peace in the, uh, in the era of Jesus um, actually uh, were the ones that killed Jesus in order to preserve world peace, literally. Mm. If we don't kill Good him, the, the Romans will come and destroy our nation. Excellent. And we don't want that. Excellent. Okay, comment here and then one back there. Pass the mic back. Yes, go ahead. Are we Seventh-day Adventists fundamentalists? We're close enough. Um, we, we're, most of us are not comfortable 
calling ourselves inerrantists. But if you look at the way inerrantists use, uh, use the Bible, especially, uh, uh, for example, there's a question of hard questions in the Bible, you'll find out that the, uh, that the inerrantists uh, use the same kind of explanations as we would use. And so there's no effective di uh, difference between the, between the two. It's just that some of us would rather say, no, there could be small errors of uh, minor stuff. It just doesn't include the major yeah, ones. Yeah, I, I am a fundamentalist. It cannot be otherwise. You know, I, I believe, so. uh, you know, I believe that, that, and you'll notice that most of the things were actually that miracles happen, the resurrection happened, the miracles of Jesus happened, the virgin birth happened. Right. See, and, and, and so what it really is, you know, the, 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 the biblical authority is basically being used to bolster those claims, which are, if you want to call it that, anti-materialist. That's what you're really looking at. The, the reason why I asked this question, nearly two years ago, after the Adventist Biblical Scholars had a meeting in Silver Springs, uh, the front page of the Adventist Review, uh, January 17, 2017, seventh the Adventists are not fundamentalists. Yes. Really? But then again, if you if you ask what the important differences are, you I mean, many many Adventists uh, believe in the atonement, for example, um, uh, substitutionary atonement. Um, but, but, but can you be an Adventist and not believe in atonement? You can be an Adventist and not believe in the substitutionary atonement. <laughs> Maybe uh, then we course, come to how do we... Of if you're going to be that, that way, uh, you can be an Adventist and not believe in creation either because there are a lot of Adventists who do, but, uh, but certainly, uh, uh, certainly that's not where the church center is. Paul, the reason why I look forward to coming here, I travel a lot, is because you, I see in, in you the core of Adventism, you see, and I pray that you never depart from it. We as a church are moving away. I mean, we should be talking about this all the time, always. You see, and we don't. What is our calling anymore? Why are we here? We have the most beautiful message to give to the mm -hmm. world. People mm -hmm. listen. And people should, no, 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 we don't know. We do not want to. Come on, Pope is in business. He knows exactly what he's doing. Yes, he does. Exactly what he's doing. He's getting the, who gave birth to Islam? Who gave birth to communism? You see, if we see the Hegelian dialectic in action right in front yeah. of our eyes, and yeah. we don't want to look that way. We want to put our heads in the sand. I'm sorry, we cannot do that for too long. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I never... A number of years ago, the sociologist Peter L. Berger wrote a book about fundamentalism around the world in all religions. And all the religions that they studied included Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, Christianity, all the major religions of the world. And they found a trend that all religions were becoming more fundamentalists, not according to your four things that you had up there, but fundamentalists towards their religion. The second point is, I think, and I'm not a prophet, but I think we're heading into a very interesting year because on May 14, the Pope has called together all the leaders of the world to come to the Vatican to discuss this very kind of thing. And if you look up the Pope's May 14 plans on the internet, you'll see some very interesting things. The second thing is in the summer, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is going to have a general conference at which we will 
have some leadership changes, I'm sure. And in the fall, we're going to re-elect, well, elect a president. Those three major events in one year, I think, could turn out to be very interesting. They could, and, and it sounds like he's already got the, uh, uh, one of the prominent imams in, in, in Egypt, maybe the most prominent imam, uh, on board already, uh, the Pope does, for his, uh, at least if you read the document, it sounds like they're kind of on the same page. The site that you were mentioning, the Vatican News site, has very interesting things, and it's all very pro-Vatican, of course. Yes. But it also has very interesting insights. Okay. Comment here, and then we have one down there. Maybe we can pass the mic down. Go ahead. It's an interesting thing. I get a publication called First Things. Uh huh. It's a Catholic. Catholic, yeah. Publication by conservative Catholics, and they wonder out loud. I've read whether or not this pope is actually a liberal Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a, another, uh, my son just showed me the rim. Well, I, I, I read <clears throat> one comment that accused him of being an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's opened himself up to quite a number of accusations. But there's another group called the Remnant. It's a Catholic group. Okay. And so, the way I see it, we have the Catholic group here, the remnant. They believe they're true Catholics. Yeah. We have Adventism and other Protestants here, uh, fundamentalists. Yeah. And yeah. then we have a divergent of both groups heading into the culture. And it's a very interesting thing that's happening now. And I can't wait to see what's going to happen at the GC. I wish I could be a mouse in the corner at that one. But well, I'm going to throw in a little more perspective. Uh, the, uh, the group that is stirring up the most uh, uh, interest right now in carbon-14 dating turns out to be uh, a Catholic group which has been dating carbon-14 dating dinosaurs and finding them to have a finite radiocarbon age. Um, now the Pope has already said he's happy with evolution which means he's definitely happy with long ages. Which um, I guess makes him liberal Protestant. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, in, in the new thing and, that's um, coming, he's a and, Protestant. And, and which means that if, if, they, if they are Catholic and they take their uh, orders from the Pope, then you have to say that they are quite literally more Catholic than the Pope. <laughs> and, and, you know, you go to their website and there's this thing devoted to Mary and how wonderful she is and so forth. And so... Uh, obviously, they're, they're, they're Catholic, they're not Protestant, but uh, it makes me wonder whether f what we're going to be seeing is a, a realignment in crazy ways. But uh, uh, I am not a prophet. No. But <laughs> anyway. I was listening to hear the preeminence of the Pope and his church Didn't as, say as, that, a, as a focus. It sounds like uh, all you fundamentalists need to get in line and recognize the leadership of the church. And my position is sub being in place of Christ. Amen. Yeah, yeah. I can't help but wonder if there are a lot of Catholics that will be, that will feel left out somehow with all this and that may be interested in finding a new home. But we will, we will see what happens with this. In, as you've looked further, is there any suggestion on the part of maybe more than just the Pope, but the main 
the main thinkers or <laughs> believers in the Catholic Church of well, doing it, something that truly is more open? Well, you know, the interesting thing is that there's never, uh, e in either the joint communique, nor in the, um, uh, in the address that he gave to this uh, IDI group, uh, is there somewhere where it says that the Pope is going to be running the whole show? I am wondering, is this because one soft pedals this at the time? Or is this because the Pope has become open enough to uh, try to g g garner everybody of goodwill? Um, certainly historically, the Pope has insisted on being the, the top dog. Uh, and it, it does raise that question as to, you know, what are they doing with papal supremacy? Well, I would guess knowing that non-Catholics, at least in the Christian world, see that as one of the primary characteristics of Catholics, not addressing that directly says all you need to hear. You mean that he's just leaving it as back? He's not addressing it knowing that everyone just kind of assumes th it. thinks that that's where the church is and where he is. And so. the thing that strikes me is the fundamentalists seem to be treated, fundamentalist Christians, because he's talking about Argentinians, and he knows about Argentinian Adventists uh, from other sources that I have. Um, uh, so is, this isn't just a, uh, uh, a hypothetical, and he says it's not a hypothetical, um, that he's kind of looking at um, he's kind of looking at them as not being worthy of the tolerance that he's shown to uh, at least some Muslims. Isn't this just another iteration of ecumenism? Sounds like it. A uh, comment in the back now. I'm going to pass the mic back. I think I've mentioned before, I was talking with a rabbi, and the definition of Messiah to the Jews is one who brings peace on earth. The Pope could be the Messiah. Uh, that was probably a liberal rabbi. <laughs> See? Yeah. Maybe we should move more compactly or something, I don't know. The Pope became the Pope in, um, in 2013. I forget the date, I think March 13 or so. Okay, within one week, he called for a world conference on peace. That happened in one and one half year later in a large stadium in Seoul, Korea, where about 100,000 people got together uh, Muslims and Hindus and Jains and Sikhs and Buddhists. Uh, there were Anglicans, Catholics, but uh, uh, I think some, some Lutherans as well. But the whole stadium full of people from different religions, one theme, we are one. And Pope can be called liberal, he can be called anything. Again, what is in his heart? That's the most important thing. Okay, so this is a wolf in the sheep's cloth. Okay, so here he's a wonderful man and he's going after the fundamentalists. He says, even Catholic fundamentalists are wrong. We cannot tolerate them. And then a crazy old lady 150 years ago says, if you stand by the Bible, you're going to be called an extremist. And that's exactly what he's calling the fundamentalists, extremists. Extremist. We're seeing it happening in our own lives. Whatever happens in the general conference and all uh, the issues we're dealing with, we have a bigger issue. And I believe that you're right that Christian fundamentalists, even Catholics who are, who are gung-ho about their faith, if they, when they find out what is truth, they're going to think twice. 
Well, how is the how is the Pope getting such a popular popularity? Number one, he says the light bulbs that we don't need, let's turn them off. The air conditioners we don't need to when you're not when you leave the house, let's turn it off. Good okay. luck selling that in Southern California. Yes. Well, look, <laughs> things are going to happen, you know, and uh, you, uh, all this fossil fuel that we're using and the world temperature is going, you know, is losing control of. People believe this, whether there's truth or not, that does not matter. Yeah. People believe that. And so people are looking at the Pope as the, they're calling him the moral leader. Not only Christian, but Catholics, the Muslims are calling him. So they're turning to him. And last point, he says, we all need a day to be together as a family, and that day is Sunday. I mean, we see yeah, this happening yeah, right in front yeah. of us. Yeah. So when someone, so, oh, he's, he just exudes sweetness and light and love, and let's all, can't we all get along? So that, that's a, a wonderful um, camouflage, Whew. big time. Thank you for doing what you're doing, by the way. It's oh. beautiful. Thank you. Uh, you know, to me, to me, it's just fascinating to look at this and, and ask some questions that, let's say, most people don't ask. Because I think that, uh, I think that these are significant uh, uh, comment back here. It's uh, we, 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 sure, but we want to we want to get it on tape. What's the United Nations reaction uh, to the Pope's uh, plan for the meeting next year? I don't know that I can answer that. There may be others here who have. Studied that in more detail. Here. I think it was 2015 when the Pope came to this country. He spoke to the joint session first of the Congress. That's the first. And then when the president is inaugurated, he walks from there to the steps, okay, and he addresses the crowd. Thousands of people at the National Mall. What did he do? He did not go the same way. He went upstairs to the balcony. Then he looked at people all over from the balcony, not where the president stands. He was above the president. From there, he did go to the United Nations. And everyone bowed down. You are the leader. You can save this world. And I see. Revelation chapter 13 coming to fruition. Mm -hmm. We're going home. I don't care about what happens in the general conference. I'm sorry. We're going home. Amen. Preach it. <laughs> it's fascinating. I uh, will just leave it at that. Uh, like I say, we'll meet here next week and I'll try to have something worthwhile for you.